Chapter 12 Lifting the Bucket I know that I digressed quite a bit in the previous chapter, but that's because I felt that what I had to say was very necessary. What I have been trying to explain is that we can accomplish a great deal through our own efforts and help ourselves to experience deep devotion during this initial phase of the spiritual path. When we think and reflect on what Christ suffered for us, we are moved by compassion. The sorrow that arises may bring tears, and there is an inexplicable sweetness in this. Thinking about the glory we are hoping for, the love Christ demonstrated for us, and the miracle of His resurrection, we are filled with a joy that is neither wholly spiritual nor entirely sensory. But it is a virtuous joy and the corresponding sorrow is equally worthy. There is virtue and worth in everything that awakens devotion, even if it comes in part through the labor of the intellect. Of course, this devotional blessing cannot be earned or obtained unless the Beloved chooses to bestow it. If God has not yet raised a soul higher than this, it is best for her not to strive to elevate herself. All she will do is thwart her own progress and suffer harm. Please take special note of this danger. There are many things the soul can do in this state to awaken love. She can make resolutions to serve God and engage in other acts that stimulate the growth of virtue. There is a book called The Art of Serving God, which does a fine job of explaining these things. It is appropriate reading for those who are at this stage in which the intellect is still an active participant in spiritual practice. The soul can picture herself in the presence of Christ in all his sacred humanity and build up the fire of love. She can keep him close to her always, talking to him, asking him for the things she needs, and confiding her troubles. When she feels joy, she can rejoice with him, but she must never let the good times make her forget him. She should try to communicate with him, not through prescribed prayers, but with the words of her own heart that express her desires and needs. This is an excellent way to make rapid progress. Any soul who strives to remain in Christ's precious company, who is sincerely grateful for this intimacy, and who truly finds herself in love with this Lord, who has done so much for us, is a soul I consider to be evolved. This is why we should not be distressed when we are not moved by devotion. We should simply thank God, who allows us to want only to please Him, even if our efforts seem less than successful. This practice of carrying Christ in our consciousness is beneficial at all phases of the spiritual path, especially in these first degrees of prayer, and it quickly advances us to the second. It also safeguards us against the perils with which the spirit of evil may confront us in the later stages. So, this is what we can do for ourselves. Anyone who tries to do more than this, struggling to elevate the spirit to obtain a taste of a divine sweetness that is not freely given, risks losing everything he has gained so far and jeopardizing future growth. These blessings belong to the realm of the supernatural. If he puts the intellect to sleep prematurely, he finds his soul desolate in a dry desert. Since the entire edifice is built on humility, the nearer we draw to God, the more we must cultivate this virtue. If we don't, everything will be ruined. Our Lord is already doing too much for us by drawing us into His presence, considering how imperfect we are. I see that it is arrogant for us to desire to ascend higher. I'm not suggesting that we shouldn't raise our consciousness by reflecting on sublime things, such as the wonders of heaven and the great wisdom of God. Personally, I never had the ability to reflect in this way as I have mentioned, and besides, I was too wretched to try. God gave me the grace early on to recognize how much courage it requires for me to even reason my way through worldly things, let alone ponder divine things. But other people can benefit from this practice, especially if they are educated. Education, in my opinion, is like a treasure that can only enhance this practice, as long as the learning is grounded in humility. I witnessed this phenomenon only a few days ago among some educated men who have only recently begun to practice prayer and have already made remarkable progress. This only reinforces my conviction that educated men should become spiritual men. 
I will say more about this later. When I say that we should not raise ourselves up to God until He raises us Himself, I am speaking the language of the Spirit. Anyone who has experience will understand me. If I'm not making myself understood, I don't know what more I can say about it. In mystical experience, the intellect ceases to function because God suspends it. If God gives me the grace and the help to explain it better, I will elaborate on this later. For now, please understand that we should not take it upon ourselves to shut down the mind. If we stop using the intellect, we will be left frozen and stupid, accomplishing nothing. When the Lord suspends the intellect and stems the flow of thoughts, He Himself gives it something to astonish and occupy it. Without any thought, the mind understands more in the length of time it takes to recite the creed than we could possibly learn in an entire lifetime through our own human efforts. To presume that we can keep the faculties of the soul busy and the mind quiet at the same time is ridiculous. Even if I am misunderstood, I will say it again. This effort to suspend the intellect is not very humble. It may not constitute a terrible mistake, but it is certainly a waste of time and energy, and it's an exercise in frustration. The soul is left like a person who is about to leap forward and is suddenly pulled back by someone else. She feels like she has depleted all her strength and has not achieved what she set out to achieve with it. Anyone who wishes to take a look at this will detect that small lack of humility I mentioned reflected in the small spiritual progress made here. Humility has this excellent quality. When it is present in any act, the act never leaves the soul with that sense of frustration. I think I have explained this clearly, but maybe I have only clarified it for myself. May the Lord open the eyes of the ones who are reading this. May He give them the experience they need to understand it, even if just a little. For many years, I read a lot of things and didn't understand anything I read. Even though God was blessing me, for a long time I couldn't come up with the words to describe His blessings. This was no small trial. Then, in a single moment, His Majesty amazed me by teaching me everything all at once. There is one thing I can say for sure. I spoke with many spiritual people about my experiences, and they tried their best to explain what the Lord was giving to me so that I would be able to talk about it, but I was too dense to understand them. Or maybe, since His Majesty has always been my greatest teacher, it was the Lord's wish that I had only Him to thank for my understanding. May He be blessed for everything. It upsets me to confess the truth about all that He has given to me. I neither requested nor desired these things, in fact, I have never even been curious about their significance, although I would have been a virtue to try and understand them. As it was, I was far more interested in trivial matters, and yet God gave me a moment of such dazzling clarity that I suddenly understood everything that had happened to me and was able to explain it all in a way that astonished me even more than it did my spiritual directors, since I was far more aware of my own stupidity than they were. Since this happened only a short time ago, I will not try to understand beyond what he has already taught me, unless it is a matter of conscience. I repeat my warning one more time. It is very important for the Spirit not to ascend unless the Lord raises it up. If he does, we will know it instantly. This effort is especially damaging for women because the spirit of evil can more readily delude us. Still, I am certain that the Lord would not allow any harm to come to someone who was humbly striving to reach Him. Instead, she is more likely to profit from the very experience the spirit of evil used to throw her off course. Many people travel the path of beginners, and the advice I have offered is exceedingly important. This is why I have elaborated to such an extreme. I admit that other writers have explained all this much better. In fact, it has embarrassed me to attempt this at all, although not as much as it probably should have. May the Lord be blessed for everything who wills and consents for such a creature as I to speak about His lofty and sublime graces. Chapter 13 Joyful Abandon 
It occurs to me now to mention certain temptations that I have noticed tend to assail beginners. I myself have grappled with many of these, and I think I have some important advice to offer. As you embark on the spiritual path, try to remember to walk with joyful abandon. Some people think that if they relax a little, their devotion will fall apart. Of course, there's nothing wrong with being self-aware so that you avoid letting arrogance lead you into habitual patterns that dishonor God. There aren't many people who are so perfect that they can afford to let down their guard against the snares of human nature altogether. So, until we are wholly virtuous, some vigilance is necessary. Throughout our lives, it is important to be mindful of our own insignificance, because this hones our humility. But there are many good reasons to engage in recreation, as I have said. For one thing, it enables us to return to prayer reinvigorated. We just need to use a little discretion in everything we do. Be confident. Don't hold back your heart's desires. Believe in the power of God. With His help, we will gradually reach the station that the saints attained. We just need to keep striving. If the saints had not been singular in their desire and steadfast in their determination, applying themselves little by little, they would never have risen to such a high state. His Majesty is the friend and lover of courageous souls as long as they walk with humility and shed self-importance. I have never seen such a soul hanging back on the path. Nor have I ever noticed a cowardly soul, especially one who hides behind a facade of false humility, make a fraction of the progress in many years that courageous souls make in only a few. I am amazed by how much can be accomplished on this path by being bold and striving for great things. Even if the soul is not quite strong enough yet, she can still lift off and take flight. She can soar to great heights. But like a fledgling bird, she may tire herself out and need to perch for a while. I used to reflect often on the words of St. Paul, who said that all things could be done through God. It was clear that I could accomplish nothing by myself. This understanding was very helpful to me. So were the words of St. Augustine, who said, Give me, Lord, what you ordain, and ordain what you will. I've always thought that St. Peter didn't lose a thing by throwing himself into the sea, even though he became afraid as soon as he had done it. This initial determination is crucial. It's also important in the early phase to move slowly, use discretion, and follow the advice of a spiritual guide. Just make sure that your guide doesn't see your soul as a toad capable of only pursuing small lizards. And always be humble, remembering that this strength arises from a power beyond our own. It's important to pay attention to the quality of this humility. One of the ways I believe that the spirit of evil hurts people who practice prayer and prevents them from making progress is by deceiving them about the true nature of humility. It makes us worry that our desire to imitate the saints is delusional and that our longing for self-denial is self-serving. Then it tries to convince us that since we ourselves are sinners, we should look to the saints for inspiration, not imitation. I do agree that it is wise to be discriminating about which deeds of the saints we should imitate and which we are meant to simply admire. It would do no good for a weak or sickly person to take on severe fasts or harsh penances or to go off alone to the desert where she could find no place to sleep and nothing to eat. But we should remember that with God's help we are fully capable of detaching from the world turning away from personal honor, and releasing our tight grasp on possessions. Our hearts are so stingy that we're afraid we'll lose the earth beneath our feet if we turn our attention away from the body for a single moment and shift our focus to the spirit. We convince ourselves that because our meditations are frequently disturbed by concerns about the necessities of life, all we need to do is secure our material things, and then we will be able to get on with the practice of prayer. It makes me sad that we have so little trust in God and so much regard for ourselves that worries like these so easily throw us off course. The truth is, when we are not evolving on the path, 
a few petty annoyances are as upsetting as numerous severe trials would be to a more mature practitioner. And we presume to call ourselves spiritual? It seems to me that people in this state are trying to reconcile body and soul in such a way that they obtain maximum comfort here on earth and ensure their entrance to heaven at the same time. If we walk in righteousness and hold fast to virtue, this method is fine. But we will advance at the pace of a chicken. We will never reach spiritual liberation this way. This is a good balance for householders who need to put their worldly obligations first. As for me, there is no way I would be satisfied with that rate of progress, nor could anyone convince me of its value. Believe me, I have tried this kind of compromise, and I would not have moved forward an inch if the Beloved in His mercy had not taught me a shortcut. I have always had strong desires, but as I mentioned, I have attempted to practice prayer and live for my own pleasure at the same time. If only there had been someone to encourage me to soar to greater heights, I might have been able to manifest these desires. But such a guide is very rare. Most spiritual directors are excessively cautious in these matters. I believe that is one of the primary reasons that beginners do not generally make more rapid progress toward perfection. It's not the Lord's fault. He never fails. It's our own lower nature that impedes us. One thing we can do is imitate the saints by seeking solitude and silence. Contrary to what we might believe, cultivating virtues like these does not endanger the well-being of the body. Sometimes the physical seems bent on thwarting the spiritual, and the minute the spirit of evil detects a little apprehension, it joins forces with these wretched bodies of ours to confound our minds. The spirit of evil would like nothing better than to make us think that our devotional practices are going to kill us, or at least do damage to our health. It even suggests that crying will make us go blind. I have been through all of this, and I know. But what higher health or deeper sight could we desire than to lose them both for such a cause? Since I have always been so sickly, I have had a tendency to allow my health to tie me down and keep me from engaging in full devotion. I don't pay so much attention to my body anymore. When the spirit of evil put it in my head to worry about compromising my health and prayer, God decided to clear my thinking. So what if I die? I asked myself. And when I wondered if it was all right to feel so tired, I answered myself, I don't need rest. What I need is the cross. I was able to counter many other troubling thoughts in this way. Even though I am chronically ill, I have clearly seen on many occasions that my concerns arose either from the spirit of evil or from my own laziness. Ever since I stopped obsessing about my comfort and ease, my health has radically improved. So it is very important not to be intimidated by our own thoughts in the early stages of the path. You can take my word on this. I know it from experience. It is my hope that simply by reading this litany of my mistakes, you will be able to avoid some of them yourselves. Here is another common temptation. Since we're beginning to enjoy the serenity and growth that comes from prayer, we want everyone else to be on a spiritual path too. There's nothing wrong with this desire but the attempt to carry it out may backfire unless you use discretion and temper your efforts so it doesn't look like you're trying to teach people. If you hope to do any good in this area, you must always act with integrity. Otherwise, you may end up inadvertently trapping other souls in a snare. I found this out the hard way, so I know what I'm talking about. When I try to persuade others to practice prayer, they would hear me talking about the wonderful blessings that come from this practice on the one hand, and then observe my own unscrupulous behavior on the other. And I was supposed to be their role model. In fact, I think I served more as a source of temptation and confusion for them. And so they had every reason to miss the mark. Later they explained to me that they could not find a way to reconcile what I preached and what I practiced. Besides. They actually believed that what was wrong was in fact right, simply because they saw me doing it myself and they respected me. 
This is a trick of the devil, who tries to twist our virtues to justify his own wicked purposes. No matter how minor our mistakes may be, the devil gains major benefit from them, especially if we commit them in spiritual community. Since my wickedness was already excessive, the spirit of evil must have profited all the more. As it turned out, over the course of many years, only three people seemed to have benefited from what I had to say to them. In the two or three years since the Beloved has strengthened me in virtue, however, many people have benefited. This effort of trying to build up other people is a significant drawback. It can detract from our own growth. In the beginning, we need to put ourselves first. The most important thing at this stage is to take care of ourselves. We should pretend that there is no one in the universe but our soul and our God. This is a very useful practice. We all feel a certain zeal for virtue. This may tempt us to judge the sins and failings of other people. The spirit of evil puts it in our minds that the distress we feel over other people's behavior stems only from a desire to protect God from being dishonored. We become so agitated by our desire to remedy the situation that we are unable to practice prayer. The greatest harm lies in our belief that this distress is a mark of our perfect virtue and passion for God. We need to be mindful of this kind of delusion. Genuine concern for the well-being of the community does not disquiet the soul in this way. The safest path for a soul who practices prayer is to pay no attention to anyone or anything else, but to focus instead on knowing herself and pleasing God. This is vitally important. If I were to tell you about all the mistakes I have seen people make in the name of good intentions, I would never be finished talking. Let us always strive to reveal the good qualities in others, and let our awareness of our own imperfections conceal their defects. We may not be able to do this perfectly at first, but we will gradually acquire great virtue by seeing everyone else as better than ourselves. Then, by the grace of God, which we always need, since without God's grace nothing is possible, we will begin to grow virtuous. Actually, we should beg God to give us these virtues. He never denies anyone who makes a sincere effort. This advice applies to people with very active intellects, who derive a multitude of ideas and concepts from a single thought. For people like me, who don't work well with their minds, my only counsel is to be patient. Eventually, the Lord illuminates us and gives us worthy work to do. Those of us with weak intellects do ourselves more harm than good by trying to think our way to enlightenment. Again, for those of you who are intellectually inclined, I would recommend that you not spend all your time thinking. Even though discursive reason has its place, and it can actually enhance the delight of prayer, intellects forget to observe a Sabbath once in a while and give their minds a rest from all that labor. They think it would be a waste of time. But I consider such waste a tremendous boon. All they need to do, as I have mentioned, is place themselves in the presence of Christ. Instead of wearing themselves out trying to make logical sense of spiritual matters, they should simply speak with Him and delight with Him. They should lay their needs at His feet and acknowledge that He has every right to deny them His company. There is a time for thinking and a time for being. Otherwise, the soul would get tired of always eating the same food. Once we accustom the palate to non-conceptual practices, they become not only delicious, but very helpful. They nourish the soul and give her life, providing all kinds of benefits. I need to keep trying to clarify things, because unless a person has a really masterful spiritual director, these matters are very difficult to understand. For someone with a sharp intellect, like the man who ordered me to write this, just touching on these subjects would be sufficient. But although I wish I could be brief, my own ineptitude prevents me from finding an adequate way to explain such important matters using a minimum of words. I suffered so much myself. I feel sorry for people who only have books to rely on. 
It's amazing how different what we think we understand is from what we learn later through experience. To come back to what I was saying, let's begin to think about an episode from the Passion. Let's say when our Lord was bound to the pillar. The intellect gets to work trying to come up with reasons why Christ had to suffer such pain and anguish, struggling to comprehend his loneliness and isolation. If a man is well-educated and works hard with his mind, he can glean a great deal of understanding from this kind of exercise. We should all begin, continue, and end with this method of prayer. It's an excellent path to follow, and a safe one, until the Lord leads us in other supernatural directions. I talk about all of us, but there are some souls who do better meditating on other things than the sacred passion. For just as in heaven there are many mansions, so there are many roads that lead there. Some people find it useful to imagine hell. Others benefit from thinking about death. Some have such tender hearts that they cannot bear to stay with the imagery of the passion. They find it comforting and inspiring to dwell on the power and glory of God as manifested in His creatures. They prefer to reflect on His infinite love for us and how this love is revealed in all things. This last way is a very good way, as long as it is balanced by sometimes thinking about the life of Christ and all that He did for our sake. He is the source of all our good, past and present. Beginners on the path require wise counsel to determine what they really need. For this reason, an experienced guide is indispensable. If the spiritual director does not have personal experience, he can be badly mistaken and easily lead souls astray simply because he does not understand them and therefore is incapable of helping them to understand themselves. For their part, beginners may be so thrilled that they have someone to guide them that they do not deviate from whatever he tells them to do. I have come upon souls so tormented and troubled by the inexperience of their spiritual guides that I felt truly sorry for them. There was one person who had no idea how to act for herself anymore. Ignorant guides do a great deal of damage to body and soul because they do not understand spiritual things. They actually obstruct spiritual progress. One person confided in me that her guide had held her in bondage for eight years by refusing to allow her to explore beyond the state of self-knowledge. Since the Beloved had already brought her to the prayer of quiet, this constraint was a great torment to her. We must never neglect this process of self-inquiry. No soul on this path is such a spiritual giant that she doesn't need to return again and again to the divine breast and suckle there. Do not forget this. Since this is so important, I will repeat it often. No stage of prayer is so sublime that the practitioner does not need to come back frequently to the beginning. Self-knowledge is the bread we must feed ourselves along the road of prayer, continuously supplementing the sublime delicacies we are given by God. In fact, without it, we cannot be sustained. Still, we should eat this bread in moderation. We empty ourselves of ourselves. We clearly understand that anything good in us comes not from us, but from God. We remember all that we owe to such a great king, and we feel ashamed of how little we have to repay him. Fine. Do not linger there. It's a waste of time. The Beloved has placed other foods in front of us, and it would be wrong to disregard them. His Majesty knows what foods are best for us to eat, at what times? This is why it's so important to work with guides who are well-informed, exhibit good judgment, and have experienced spiritual things themselves. It wouldn't hurt if they had some formal education as well. If they cannot meet all these criteria, they should at least have experience and sound judgment. It's always possible to locate a man of learning and consult with him when particular theological issues come up. Unless a learned man practices prayer himself, all his learning is of little help to beginners on the path. I do not mean to imply that beginners should have nothing to do with educated men. I would rather see a spirit standing on the solid ground of truth without prayer than one who prays but has no knowledge. Learning is a great thing, because learned men teach those of us who know so little 
and illumine our ignorant minds. When we are exposed to the truths of sacred scripture, we are able to behave the way we should. God saves us from foolish devotions. I should explain myself better, but I keep going off on tangents. I have always been bad at explaining myself. I don't seem to know how to say things without using too many words. All right. A contemplative begins to practice prayer. Her spiritual guide is a fool, and he takes it into his head that she should obey him unconditionally. He does not demand this out of malice. If he is not engaged in contemplative practice himself, he will think he is doing the right thing. Maybe she is a householder, and he tells her to ignore the tasks at hand and just pray. This would put a great deal of stress on her marriage and family. Such a spiritual director doesn't know how to arrange things or manage time in a way that conforms to reality. Because he lacks light himself, he is incapable of enlightening anyone else, even though he might sincerely want to. While I do not believe that true knowledge is dependent on education, I do think that every spiritual seeker should make an effort to have conversations with those who have a background in studies. The more educated the person, the better. The more spiritual the one who practices prayer, the greater her need for this kind of input. We should not deceive ourselves by concluding that spiritual directors who do not practice prayer are useless to those of us who do. Over the years, I have increasingly sought the counsel of learned men because I desperately needed it. I have always had educated friends. Even though many of them lack contemplative experience, they certainly do not despise the spirit, nor do they ignore it. After all, the scriptures they study continuously reveal the truth of the good spirit. I believe that the devil will never be able to deceive a soul who practices prayer and consults learned men unless she chooses to be deceived. Real learning, accompanied by humility and virtue, is a terrifying thing to the powers of evil because it finds them out and banishes them. I've emphasized this because there is a popular opinion that unless learned men are also spiritual, they are no help to people who practice prayer. I have already said that I believe it's necessary to have a spiritual director and that if he is not a learned man, this lack of learning is a serious drawback. If an educated man has integrity, even if he has not had direct spiritual experience, it can be very useful to consult him. God will help him to explain to us what we need to know. He may even give him the spiritual experience he lacks, and he will benefit us accordingly. I speak from experience. This has happened to me at least twice. I repeat, any contemplative who puts herself in the hands of a single spiritual director without being certain that he possesses all the virtues I have mentioned will be making a big mistake. It is a heavy enough cross to bear when we forge a relationship with a guide who lacks these spiritual qualities. If his understanding is also poor, how can we voluntarily submit to his guidance? I myself have never been able to bring myself to do this, nor do I think that kind of submission is ever a good thing. If the beginner on the path to prayer is not a monastic but a person who lives in the world, she should take advantage of the gift of freedom to choose her own spiritual director and praise God for it. She should take her time in selecting a guide until she finds someone suitable. Meanwhile, she should cultivate her own humility and desire to make spiritual progress. If she does her part in this way, the Beloved will provide the right teacher for her. I praise God with all my heart. All women and other people who have not had the benefit of an education should be infinitely grateful to him, for he has given us access to men who have labored hard to attain truths that those of us who are ignorant know nothing about. I am frequently amazed that learned men, religious ones in particular, would bother to offer me the fruits of their labors simply because I ask. Imagine, there are people who have no desire to benefit from the work of these scholars. God forbid! I witness these men bearing the intense hardships of monastic life with its many penances, it's bad food, it's obligation of strict obedience, and it puts me to shame.
On top of all of this, they endure a constant lack of sleep. Everything is a trial for them, everything a cross. It seems to me that it would be a terrible waste for anyone to forfeit the benefits of such a life willingly. Those of us who live as we please, free from such burdens, have spiritual food dropped into our mouths, as they say. Because we spend a little more time practicing prayer, we assume that we deserve more than those who have labored long hours to reap the fruits of knowledge. Blessed be you, O Lord, who has made me incompetent and useless, and bless you even more for awakening so many to awaken us. We should pray unceasingly for those who give us light. What will we do without them during these tempestuous times when so many troubles buffet our society? If some of our leaders have gone bad, the good people shine even more brightly. May it please God to hold such souls in His hand and help them to help us. Amen. I certainly have wandered off the subject I meant to speak about. But for those who are embarking on such a lofty journey, everything can be harnessed to set their feet on the right path. Let's go back to what I was saying about meditating on Christ bound to the pillar. It's good to spend some time thinking and reflecting on the pains he suffered in those moments, why, who he is, and the love with which he bore his suffering. But we should not make a habit of exhausting ourselves in pursuit of these reflections. Rather, we should stay there in his presence with our minds quiet, our thoughts at rest. If we can, we should occupy ourselves with simply gazing at he who is gazing at us. We should keep him company, talk with him, pray to him, humble ourselves and delight in him. Remember what a privilege it is to be near him. Even if we only start off our prayer in this way, our souls will derive great benefit from this practice. I know mine has. I don't know if I have succeeded in explaining this. You will have to be the judge of that. May it please the Lord that I bring him pleasure forever. Amen.